So um, get your heads up, hold your music out, and that way you'll project out and open up your jaw so you project and then you get a nice good sound. No, Greta is much more capable. <laughs> Welcome to the Church of the Holy Spirit. Today we celebrate the second Sunday in Advent. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is being offered for Noel Gary. Please join us in singing the opening hymn number 40 on Jordan's Bank, number 40. Yeah. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty and merciful God, may no earthly undertaking hinder those who set out in haste to meet your Son, but may our learning of heavenly wisdom gain us admittance to his company, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Baruch. Jerusalem, take off your robe of mourning and misery. Put on the splendor of glory from God forever, wrapped in the cloak of justice from God. Bear on your heads the mitre that displays the glory of the eternal name. For God will show all the earth your splendor. You will be named by God forever the peace of justice, the glory of God's worship. Up, Jerusalem, stand upon the heights. Look to the east and see your children gathered from the east and the west at the word of the Holy One, rejoicing that they are remembered by God. Led away on foot by their enemies, they left you, but God will bring them back to you. Born aloft in glory, as on royal thrones. For God has commanded that every lofty mountain be made low, and that the age-old depths and gorges be filled to level ground, that Israel may advance secure in the glory of God. The forests and every kind of fragrant tree have overshadowed Israel at God's command. For God is leading Israel in joy by the light of his glory with his mercy and justice for company. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I pray always with joy in my every prayer for all of you. Because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is my witness. How I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may increase ever more and more in knowledge and every kind of perception to discern what is of value so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God, the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region, region of Arteria and Traconitis, and Licinius was the tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding road shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The gospel of the Lord. There are a lot of things that we do to prepare for Christmas. Tomorrow afternoon, I am taking an annual trip with my friend, Father Brian Nelson, to go find a tree. We used to drive out to St. John, Kansas, which would give us uh, quite a while to visit and talk about our priesthood and for me to quiz him about canon law, which I'm sure he loved. And uh, we decided this year that um, the trees out, out at St. John, they have a wonderful variety, like seven or eight different varieties of trees, but they're all, they're all small right now. So we were going to try a different tree farm. I was also very proud of myself because this past week I was down to uh, one gift that I needed for a uh, godson, and the rest were purchased and ready. I was afraid that I would indeed have to get on a raft and row out to a boat outside of California to get my Amazon delivery. There's a lot of things that we do to make sure that we're prepared for Christmas, that when we hit Christmas Eve, we've done everything that we needed to do. We've planned the family gathering, we put the tree up, we've decorated the house, we've got our shopping done. 
But often we fall into this temptation of preparing for Christmas, but not for Christ. John the Baptist teaches us what a preparation for Christmas is like. Remember, he was preparing the people to receive Jesus in his public ministry. He was the forerunner of of Jesus, and that's why during the Advent season, we hear a lot about John the Baptist. And the first thing that he teaches us is that God is found in the desert, not in the city. It would make some sense to actually have John go to Jerusalem, right? To proclaim that the Messiah is coming and you should repent and let's get ready for him. But he doesn't go to Jerusalem. He doesn't go to the big city. He goes out into the desert and invites people to come out to him for repentance. And my brothers and sisters, that same rule of life is still true for us. You see, John's John the Baptist church was in the desert. It is a place free of stimuli. And my brothers and sisters, that's still where we encounter God. It is a place free from stimuli. But we must create that for ourselves. Whether it's an annual retreat or what we call as priests, we call it a desert day where we turn off our phones and we don't, get, we don't turn the TV on, we don't turn... Uh, our, our get on social media or get on the computer, we take a day to just be totally removed from what last week's gospel called the anxieties of life. In fact, this season of Advent, you may notice I'm wearing a purple today. My friend from college calls it my Barney suit. Um, it's symbolic of royalty because in the ancient world, purple was the hardest color to dye. Um, And so only the rich could afford to get purple. And so it was associated with kingship and royalty and wealth. And certainly we are preparing for a king to come, right? Some of you probably saw the meme on Facebook this past week that said the first king-size bed, and then it had the manger, right? Right? It is truly a king that we're getting, to wel- getting ready to welcome into the world. But when else do we also wear purple? Well, it's during Lent, right? A time of, of penance. And often Advent in the church has been associated with kind of a lighter time of penance to get ourselves ready. Why? To remove ourselves from all the stimuli, Right? And that's exactly what penance does. When I give up my coffee or give up my chocolate chip cookies or give up watching TV, I remove myself from all the distractions so that I can more clearly hear God. But we must create this experience for ourselves. I remember the first time I I went on an eight-day silent retreat up at uh, Creighton in Omaha as part of a program called IPF, the Institute of Priestly Formation, I was still a seminarian, and after the first day, I was ready to leave. Because let's be honest, when you're quiet, you start hearing all the anxieties rush in. Your own anxieties, other people's. It is hard to be quiet. It's disturbing. But I also look at the grace that was obtained through that. It was a difficult time. It was a difficult eight days. And at points, I was just doing whatever I needed to do to make it through, going for a walk or taking a nap. But I look back, and I see that as one of the most pivotal moments in my discernment. Because I was quiet with God. I went out into the desert. And my brothers and sisters, we all need this experience. Not just priests, not just nuns, not just monks out in the middle of nowhere. Every single Christian needs that kind of experience. I've suggested this to you before, and I suggest it again. Go downstairs, find your breaker panel, open it up, and at the top is a very big switch. Flip it. Flip it. And turn your phone off. And spend three hours in quiet. Guys, God can do so much if we're willing to just remove ourselves from all the worldly things around us. 
Secondly, John the Baptist, while he teaches us that we need to enter into a desert experience and this can be a penitential time of the year, it's not the same as Lent. We, we don't take on the severity of fasting that we do during Lent. Why? Because this is also a joyful time. And as Christians, we should be joyful. We should be celebrating. Go to Christmas parties. But remembering also where true joy is found. You know, I've spent now uh, 11 years in the Catholic schools, which isn't long for some of us, but it, it's allowed me to see kids growing up and being formed. And it's indeed true what psychologists tell us, that their personalities are formed by age three or four. Because when we get them in school here, they definitely have their personalities. And those persist through the years, for good or for bad. But I've also observed over the years, and just reflecting even on my own life as an adult, like looking at them and seeing their childhood and their simplicity, and Jesus, of course, uh, says that, you know, unless we are like children, we, we aren't ready for the kingdom of heaven. What is it about them? And I was thinking about this the other day in regards to Christmas. Well, we addict our children at an early age to sugar, and at Christmas time, the promise of getting something, right? And then when we become adults, well, we could still get sugar, but it doesn't do the same thing it used to for us. And nobody buys me toys anymore. And what we train ourselves to do, unfortunately, growing up, is because we want to take care of our children, because we want to spoil them, we actually train them to look at just the immediate satisfactions. I wonder how many of our children out there do you remember what you asked for for Christmas last year? Do you still play with it? Guys, that's just how fleeting sometimes the things of this world can be. What about what you got for Christmas three years ago? Do you know what it was? Do you still play with it? Think back for our adults. Think back to when you were in high school. What was the one thing you thought would make you happy? A boyfriend, a girlfriend, a car? You probably got those things to one degree or another. Did they make you happy? One of the keys to this season is actually being joyful, yes, but making sure that all of those joyful things point towards the one joy. And that is finding our satisfaction in God alone. St. Bonaventure says this, In God alone is their primordial and true delight. And in all our delights, it is this delight that we are seeking. In other words, that desire for a boyfriend, that desire for a girlfriend, that desire for a car, that desire for a toy, that desire for an Xbox one X series, which is now up to $933 at Walmart, which is ridiculous. Guys, the desire for all those things, unless they point us to the desire for heaven and eternity, they're not helping us. Thirdly, this passage from Isaiah is quoted about John in our gospel today, saying, make straight your paths. Make straight your paths. This idea of a path is very key to our Christianity. In fact, Jesus himself says that the road or path to hell is wide, and many people follow it, but the road to heaven is narrow. And he doesn't say that to make us despair, but he does want us to buy in. Because if all we do is just follow the flow of society, it's not going to take us to heaven. And I think some of us maybe also, when we look at that path, we, we look at our own path and we think that, well, maybe I don't have a chance. Because 10 years ago, I made this one decision that kind of got me off the path and 
and I don't think I can ever get back on. And if the road's straight and narrow, I certainly didn't follow the narrow. My brothers and sisters, that's Satan talking. The beautiful thing about our God, yes, he demands a lot of us. He calls himself in the Gospels in one of the perils a demanding taskmaster. But not in a mean way, but in a merciful way. He holds us to the standard that he knows we're capable of. And when we get off that path, he is ready to bring us right back on it. Have you heard that saying before that God writes straight with crooked lines? God writes straight with crooked lines. If if I were to draw a line on the wall up here, kids don't draw any lines on the walls of the church, but if I were to draw up here on the side of the church and made a squiggle back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all the way down the wall, and you stood back there by the cry room and you looked at it, what would it look like? A line. Now, to my narrow point of view, standing right in front of that wall, I'm like, it's back and forth, and it's all over the place. And it doesn't seem consistent at all. But to God's point of view, because he's standing back seeing the bigger picture, he sees that it is a straight line, and that it's headed in the right direction. God writes straight with crooked lines. I think it's important for us to recognize as Christians that God has a plan for our life. He did not. This is a very common sense today. People don't say this outright, but it's underneath their belief that God is what we call a deist. That that he just set us in motion and let us go to fend for ourselves. No. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to guide us every step of the way. The problem is, most of us, when we get up in the morning, we're not asking for the Holy Spirit's help to guide us that day. So do that. God wants to take care of you. He's a loving Father. And so ask for His guidance each day. And if you feel that your path has really gotten off, I want to invite you to confession this Advent. We'll we'll be hosting a parish Time for Confessions on the fourth Sunday of Advent at 3 p.m. I'm trying to find all the deaf priests for you. And one of the greatest gifts that you could give your pastor, really the only one I need or want, is for you to come to confession this Advent, all of you, no matter how long it's been. And I know for some of you here today, You haven't been to confession since you were a kid, and you're now an adult, and that's overwhelming to you. For some of you, you did something so bad that you wonder if you can be forgiven. And the answer is absolutely. God loves you very much. He wants to set you back on that straight and narrow path, but he does need your cooperation. So please come and make a good confession this Advent. Preparing for Christmas should be a very joyful experience. Decorate, feast, have fun, but also do not forget the church of John the Baptist. I encourage you to find a way in these remaining weeks before Christmas to create a desert experience for yourself for at least three hours or one day to be alone apart from the world with Jesus, to delight in lasting things, and to make straight your path so that you may not just be preparing for Christmas, but be preparing for Christ. Our profession of faith, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Through him all things are made. For us men and for our salvation, 
Trusting in our Father's care for us, we now turn to him in our need. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Bishop Carl Kimmy, and all the clergy, that like John the Baptist, they may herald the Savior's coming, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, that the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and strength, knowledge and fear of the Lord, may come to rest upon us. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For a world ravaged by war, violence, and political misrule, that Christ our King may cause justice and peace to flower in our days. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all members of this parish, that God may grant us to think in harmony with one another, and so, with one voice, Glorify our Father in heaven, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the benefactors of this community, that the Lord may reward their generosity, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We also turn to the Lord today to pray for this ongoing battle that is being played out in our nation's courts over the sanctity of human life. We pray for our judges for all the peoples of our country, that their hearts may be open to seeing the most vulnerable among us. And we pray, Lord, for a positive outcome from their rulings through the intercession of Mary as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to your altar today in praise of you and thanking you for your many blessings and also asking you to hear these our needs through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join us in singing the offertory hymn, number 598, Christ Be Our Light, number 598.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Be pleased, O Lord, with our humble prayers and offerings. And since we have no merits to plead our cause, come, we pray, to our rescue with the protection of your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he assumed at his first coming the lowliness of human flesh, and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago, and opened for us the way to eternal salvation. That when he comes again in glory and majesty, and all is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hope. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Carl, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. 
welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we wait the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Behold, behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Brothers and sisters, um, three times over the last two weeks, we have found the Eucharist somewhere in the church, um, either on the floor or in a pew. And um, we, we need to address that. Um, for those of you who maybe um, aren't Catholic or have been away from the church for a while, we regard the Eucharist as very sacred. We do believe it to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ truly. And so it is highly inappropriate to leave that host once received anywhere but inside yourself. Um, in my experience, this happens for one of two reasons. Either somebody is, is simply ignorant of, of what the Eucharist is, so I explain it. Or sometimes it's a, um, a person who knows they're in serious sin and they know they shouldn't receive the Eucharist and so they dispose of it. Um, unfortunately, that's committing an even graver sin, uh, a sin of what we call sacrilege. It is an excommunicable offense, uh, meaning you, you, if you do it knowingly, you're no longer part of the Catholic Church because it's so severe. So I'd ask two things. One, if you are a person who is doing this, um, please repent. God wants to forgive you. Uh, you're not lost, but please stop. And secondly, I'd ask that we we look out for each other and look out for the, for the Eucharist. Um, parents, please watch your children uh, to make sure that they consume the Eucharist and um, watch out for each other. Um, you don't have to do it in a mean way, um, but it is safeguarding the, the sacredness of the sacrament. And if you see somebody who did not immediately consume their Eucharist, you have every right to go up to them and say, either consume it or give it to me and then bring it to the altar. I want to remind our ushers, once receiving communion, to stand in the side aisles and to, to make sure people do consume the Eucharist. Um, and and if, if this doesn't change, we are going to have to make some changes to, to communion to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Please join us in singing the communion hymn number 45, the, A Voice Cries Out, number 4-5. Oh. 
Let us pray. Refreshed by the food of spiritual nourishment, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that through our partaking in this mystery, you may teach us to judge wisely the things of earth and hold firm to the things of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Coffee and Rolls is available after Mass, and the Knights of Columbus will be hosting their annual December breakfast after Masses next Sunday. The proceeds of that breakfast will go to the Holy Spirit seminarians and uh, our retired priests of the diocese. This Wednesday is a holy day of obligation, the Immaculate Conception, and we do need, still need help with ministries. If you could sign up on your left-hand side on the way out, we have Mass Tuesday evening for the vigil and Wednesday morning at 8 and at noon. Just a reminder that your gifts for Medical Lodge need to be turned in to the gathering space by December 15th. And um, we, you may have noticed all 
books in the gathering space on the way in. We are hosting this weekend a book fair, and some of our teachers and our librarian have uh, made a stack of some books that they would like to have in our library and classrooms. If you'd be willing to, to maybe make that gift to the library or the classrooms, um, we would uh, very much be honored to, to have your gift. Um, or if you would like to buy a book for a, a child or a grandchild or a niece or nephew, uh, there's a lot of children's books available in there. And um, we've partnered with a, a, a company called Eighth Day Books. Some of you are familiar with them um, because we, we really would like to support somebody local and we want to support somebody who shares our, our values. Um, so just want to encourage you to be, to be generous uh, with them and uh, with the book fair. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Please kneel in prayer immediately after the hymn until the servers have returned the candles to the altar and have extinguished them. Please join us in singing the closing hymn number 46, The King Shall Come.